That is the first it's reason true. it's important. Yes. <laughs> because it's true. No <laughs> question. No, 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 no. That's important. No question. So then, okay, so so let's think about this in the context of our brother Just, uh, Justin Pierce these, these, and Justin Jones. These are 20-somethings. Age is absolutely not an excuse. It absolutely is a partial explanation, depending on what we're trying to focus on. Um, I was talking to um, my brother Errol Henderson the other day. Uh, he wrote a book, which is actually available. You can find a PDF of this called The Revolution Will Not Be Theorized, Cultural Revolution in the Black Power Era. I just happen to have it here because I just talked to him yesterday. And Errol was talking about this book chronicles the the, the 1960s and 70s, the so-called Black Power Era. And he does a deep dive, a case study of uh, about a half dozen black power organizations, ones that we uh, know. Revolutionary Action Movement, our brother Muhammad Ahmed, who's still around, uh, Max Stanford, he was known as um, us, the organization us and the kind of affiliate organizations that kind of come out of that moment in the, in the Bay Area and in Southern California in the 1960s. Um, the Panthers, of course, Black Panther Party. Um, the League of Revolutionary uh, Black Workers, um, very important um, in Detroit, coming out of DRUM, the Dodge Movement, um, the Republic of New Africa, of course, and um, the Congress of African People, that's uh, Mary Baraka and them, uh, Newark, Committee for a Unified Newark, and of course, the Shrine of the Black Madonna, uh, Errol very proud son of Brewster Projects in Detroit. Shout out to Errol Henderson. He wanted to write a book, he said, because a lot of discussions of our political movements, and he focused specifically on the so-called civil rights movement and the so-called black power movement in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. A lot of work on that, and by work, I mean, now let me not use the word work. I'm gonna stop affiliating the word work with writing because writing is work, but it kind of displaces the notion in some ways. Um. A lot of academic scholarship on those periods tend to be historical. He said, I wanted to write a book that engaged in some theory building. So he, he says the most important theoretical figure of that period of the 60s was Malcolm X in his mind. And I was talking to him yesterday. We were talking about Rosa Parks, who he knew in Detroit. Rosa Parks would be on the front line in protests. Rosa Parks was always involved in organizing and moving and, you know, he says, when you think about our communities, you can't think, you can, but it won't be very useful to think of us in these rigid ideological boxes. And he said that when you see a Rosa Parks, we have her stuck on a bus in Montgomery. And now, of course, they've got a doll of her stuck on the damn bus in Montgomery for sale. The social structure in this country needs black people to fit into its uses, its its uh, its needs in order to utterly destroy the existing social relations and build different social relations. We're going to have to take very seriously. The work of examining ourselves, I'm not sure that can be done in mixed company, quite frankly, because whiteness has a way of centering itself, even when it doesn't want to. So, and let me be very, very specific in this conversation I was having with Earl. He said, Earl said, one of the reasons we need to look at the Black Power Movement as more than just the, uh, the list of names and what they did and where they did it and sit back and think about this in terms of concepts and theories without getting too heavily jargon-esque and theoretical, because, you know, we've been at this now, 162 Saturdays and counting, in addition to now having Nubia narrative and having this kind of flowering and, and mushrooming space we have to think about, or we should think about, how we critically assess the impact of our unbroken struggles. So let me be very specific about this. And there, I know there are a lot, I mean, you know, in talking to uh, Bishop Kimathi, the, in the shrine, the Deacon Matthew Nelson. I know all the ministers of the shrine are regular members of this week 
weekly community, the shrine still exists. The shrine still holds a lot of weight, owns a lot of property, touches a lot of people, engages in this deep work, the Pan-African Orthodox Church. And we talked about that, of course, Bishop Jeremogi, of course, and, and Errol writes about the, 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 the shrine. The shrine still exists. He said, whereas the Panthers, us, Congress of African people, Lee Revolutionary Black Workers, Republic of New Africa, are often narrated by what I would call, what we would call social structure narratives and people who are writing to the social structure. I'm talking about even black academics who are trying to get book contracts, trying to get university press books, trying to call themselves insurgents, but really, you know, really trying to write and are kind of being curated by this external factors. These, the, 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 they regroup these organizations and these people into these. Are they revolutionary nationalists? Are they cultural nationalists? He said the question of culture is very central to all of this. He said, when you look at something like the shrine, and I hope there's some shrine folk here this morning in Nubia, and if not, uh, I think y'all, and those of you who watch it through the week on the YouTube side, you know, hope you all put this in the comments as well to kind of flesh this out. Because, again, these comments are so rich. We write in books every week and throughout the week. I mean, man. He says, Errol says, the shrine coming out of the Black Power era with all these organizations and others like the Nation of Islam, for example, are saying we must have Black institutions that we control, that we develop, and that, and, and, and that have as part of our work. And by we now, I mean members of these organizations and the communities they touch, whether it be legal revolutionary black workers in Detroit, which say we must ground our efforts in those who work the line at Dodge and Ford and Chrysler and the communities that we come out of. That's the quote unquote vanguard. He talks a lot about how the black, you know, nationalists and the Marxists had their conflicts, but then their things they share in common. He takes it all the way back to the 20s and 30s. He talks about Du Bois and black reconstruction in America. He takes it through Harold Cruz, who he knew was on the dissertation committee, actually, a crisis Negro intellectual. Very interesting. He said, you know, where is the locus of building the we? The locus of building the we has to be in the people, not in the quote unquote elite, that little sliver where there were some concessions made in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s that allowed them a little bit of a, a, a of an escape route so that now these are the people who we might end up seeing in the code switching places more often than not. Now, he's talking about the masses of people. He said, and I hate to use the word masses because it assumes when we hear masses, we assume this is a group of people who all think alike, who all move alike, and we know that's not true. We're talking about mostly a socioeconomic status. Whereas the Black Panthers would say, oh, it's the lumping proletariat, whatever, you know, the, 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 the legal revolutionary black workers say, yeah, they in the lower classes, but we work in working class people, communities, and the Panthers had the free breakfast programs, the liberation schools, all this very important work, and legal revolutionary black workers, you know, say, yeah, we, we got to do that work, and but we differ maybe slightly on how to approach the work. Now, I'm just laying all that field out because I really hadn't intended to get into, in, into Errol's book today, but it's a good place for us to kind of turn in terms of this broader conversation we've been having what Errol proposes and help me shrine folk who are here is that the shrine bishop clegg albert clegg baba jeremoji saying you know the push to build a we needs to involve sending our representatives into these strategic positions in the broader social structure, whether it be politics, whether it be business, you know, social structure facing business. And he focuses on politics in particular to say that a lot of these black nationalist organizations pushed for electoral politics representation from our community to advance our interests. Same thing we're talking about today, but different. And here's where I go through it. I'm just going to take about maybe two minutes to talk about this. He focuses, for example, 1972, the Gary Political Convention that we talked about, Gary, Indiana. You know, we've got a black mayor, Richard Hatcher, he and Stokes and Cleveland, the two first two black mayors of major American cities. You know, they call the convention. Uh, Mary Baraka, of course, Betty Shabazz is there. Of course, Scott King, they opened the convention. And we've talked about that before, too. I'm not going to go over this ground again. I'm just going to make the point that electoral politics is part of the strategy. It's not the goal, but it is a tool, a strategy. Well, what he says is that as repression, as it always does in a social structure that's anti-Black, and that's absolutely what we're still living in, not just in the U.S., but globally, 
as this system pushes back, the politics of the elected officials begins to take the contour, not so much of the communities that send them there, and this is predictable, but the places they enter. So those first wave of black elected officials are gonna be hella black in many ways, whether it be coming through organized labor like Coleman Young in Detroit, maybe a, a little slight overlap, but a generation or so later, Harold Washington in Chicago, you know, you're gonna see them come out of coalition politics that reflect the 1960s and 70s. But then subsequent generations are gonna get farther away from that. And what Errol talks about is, he says, you got something like the Shrine of Black Madonna and pushing for, among all these other organizations as well, pushing for black elected officials. And now what remains of that today is that blackness has become more of an identity than a representative of broad black community interests. So it is not unusual to see, well, it is unusual in this moment, but you can understand the provenance of a Justin Pearson showing up on the floor of the Tennessee legislature in a dashiki covering a shirt and tie. People say that's a contradiction. Not a contradiction at all. If you understand how the social structure has curated the ways that we talk about black political power in its framework. At the same time, you can understand when Justin Pearson shows up and makes his ritual appearance on the Breakfast Club. Talking to Charlemagne. And. Charlemagne takes a call from a sister who says. Yeah, I understand. You know, I need to understand specifically what are you going to do specifically for black people? I'm asking the question of reparations. What is the reparations question? OK, this is the a descendant of slaves or slavery, I guess, position. I can hear Errol Henderson saying this, too, was predictable. Why? Because the reparations movement, which has a solid leg in Detroit. Reparations, Ray Jenkins, you know, John Conyers representative, whereas John Conyers was pushing for H.R. 40 for decades coming out of the influence of the black nationalist formations in Detroit, pushing for reparations and connected to the black nationalist formations and internationalist formations around the country. Justin Pearson is confronted with a question from a sister who may or may not know that history, but certainly now does not equate seeing a black elected official with representing black interests. But that is a logical and natural progression when you don't have independent black politics, which can shape and then send into these combat arenas. And by combat arenas, I don't even just mean electoral politics. I mean mass media. I mean every other form of mediation outside of black community uh, mediation, any form of uh, uh, any formation outside of black communities. That is a natural progression if you don't have a strong internal mechanism, institutions, formations. Again, this is the ongoing uh, work that we're doing here in Nubia. This is the ongoing work. If you have a strong base that you can then project out into these spaces, what history shows us is that's been the most effective way to, to either transform the spaces nominally, we haven't succeeded at transforming them yet, but certainly altering them in some way, certainly knocking them off their previous plans. Now, of course, we can debate whether or not they can recover, and it seems increasingly that they're not going to be able to recover. I mean, the modern world system we live in, which is fracturing as we speak. I know y'all been paying attention. Uh, Xi Jinping just hosted uh, Macron from France. He tried Macron trying to uh, make all the sides work together, and he getting slapped from every side. But he also hosted Lula da Silva. That's in all the papers last week. Lula was just came back from China. I mean, matter of fact, he may still be over there. Anyway, as the world changes, the American Negro disconnected in part because our movement and memory is weak another one of errol's points we don't always pay attention to the fact that this was predictable to have black elected officials who are grounded in their very specific black experiences Justin Pearson, this isn't a critique. The man came out of West Tennessee. He went to school at Bowdoin. He, you know, and then he came back to home. He's been busting his ass on gun violence and everything else. Part of a deep rooted tradition of struggle and protest. He's elected to the state legislature. He shows up who as who he is. You know, I went back and looked at a few of, of the young brother's sermons prior to this moment. 
And yeah, he preaches like he talked in the legislature. Sure, there may have been a, a kind of um a kind of intensification, not intensification, almost that's not. There may have been a more intense articulation of his pulpit speech, but it wasn't inauthentic. It was not inauthentic. It, 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 and, and that can be attributed, and I can say this as an old theater major, that can be attributed to nerves. This man, being, he's facing down every white nationalist in the whole damn world, in the well of the hillbilly Tennessee state legislature. So uh, if he says, oh, but Sunday is coming, the man is drawing on what he knows. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so while part of me is like, uh, the other part of me is like, go ahead, man, work it out. Because you, what you're not going to do is flinch. And you and the young brother Jones, when Justin Jones confronted that hillbilly uh, the other day, uh, um, uh, John Rogan, that hillbilly, he said, I believe in God. And Justin Jones quoted without looking down Isaiah uh, chapter 10 about beware of this fault bearing false witness. Oh, yeah. And then the hillbilly who likes to play with the... Uh, likes to play with the microphones, uh, the Speaker of the Tennessee House, uh, Sexton, Cameron Sexton, you know, cut off his mic because they like cutting off mics because they can't stand it. You know, that's at a moment when I appreciate when you wince, when you hear a Negro who speaks a certain way. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, cut it off. Because nobody questions these hillbillies when they come in there sounding like Roy Acuff and Dolly Parton. Nobody questions these hillbillies when they come in there sounding sound like Lim, little Jimmy Dickens and Jimmy Dean. Nobody uh, questions these hillbillies when they show up like uh, sounding like Hank Williams, Jr. and Sr., even though something, many of them not from Tennessee. You know, that performance of speech. But when we see that moment, the blackness that is being projected is not the same blackness of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, and 90s. It has been intersected by a number of social structure disruptions, a number of disruptions in science and technology, a number of disruptions, and almost complete severances of movement and memory. So that leaves us with the question, what should, can we do? I'm going to pause here and say, that I think one of the central potential, and I say potential with this, because again, three years now, hundreds of hours at this point of conversation with a lot of breadcrumbs to use our original metaphor, Professor Hunter. We, these are just all points of entry we have to immerse ourselves in self-study, self-evaluation, so that we can see the patterns, make the adjustments, innovate, and move collectively forward because there is no we. The we was convened from without. I'm not going to go back over this we, uh, uh, because we've talked about it so many times. I'm just, I'm just evoking that there is no we. So when we say by we, meaning those of us who have been grouped and categorized, as uh, Michael Gomez wrote in Exchanging Our Country Mark, in, in Exchanging Our Country Marks, he says, the black elite don't represent black America. They are a part of black America. But when we're talking about representing the collective interests of everyone, they increasingly do not do that. He says, it is the vast majority of the people who do the most suffering who continue to represent Africa to America. This is critical. So let me reset and ask, what can we do? What should we be paying attention to as we engage in this deep dive of study? Well, when we talk about collective power, this requires on the ground organizing. I said, I want to use on the ground again, on the ground. Because again, these metaphors reinforce in our mind these divisions, which don't have to be divisions. We all bring valuable work, metaphorically, as, as you say, bricks to the table, as we convene ourselves through the, I want to say difficult work, but it's really not hard. It requires commitment of getting to know each other, 
getting to share our stories with each other, getting to pool our resources. And our first and most important resources are us. We are the bricks, our time, our talents, our efforts. Let me put a footnote here and say, Prof, that I, I, that's what I was going to say about an hour ago. Bring greetings. I was on campus yesterday. My nephew is in town. They got these spring fests going on everywhere. And then we start talking about freaking. That's what remind me. This is the season. The colleges are having their spring things. And they had accepted students day yesterday at a number of places, Howard University being one. And I was on campus and all these parents were coming up with their children who are now got to choose whether or not they're going to go into debt or try to get enough scholarship money to come to uh, to college at Howard as opposed to somewhere else. Now it's, now it's about how much money can you afford. But these parents were saying, you know, tell Professor Hunter, say hello. Why, you know, we watch you all through the week. A lot of them watch on YouTube. Some of them, they were saying we're Nubians. Oh, wow, this is great. This is something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. They're talking about how this kind of just having these conversations and, and kind of convening these resources uh, one brother I was talking to yesterday, he was there. His wife, his daughter is coming in the fall. She's a, she's going to be a, a do a physician's assistant work as an undergraduate. He said, you know, it really transformed the way I think. What what we're doing together is transforming the way I look at the world. And I said, well, that's a blessing. He said, no, thank you, man, because it's really changed. I said, well, look, thank you because we're doing this together. It's affirming who we are as human beings. It's affirming who we are as African people. And it's affirming how these things are not accidents. They are connected and that we have this long genealogist momentum of memory. So that was the footnote. No. So as we're thinking about convening these we's to move forward with collective power, we understand the source of that is the broader community, not that part of the community that the social structure deliberately tries to curate to maintain its hierarchy, the one that's fracturing globally. Okay, so we'll wind this up kind of quickly today because um, among other things, if you're in the, the DMV area uh, today at two o'clock, we're gonna be down at, at one of our spots, of course, and co fulfillment books. Uh, there's a screening of a documentary on the great poet, critic, historian, culture keeper, more than anything, master teacher, Sterling Allen Brown. Sterling Brown, um, this is a collection of his poetry. Um, Michael Harper edited many years ago the collected poems of Sterling Allen Brown. This is uh, probably the best single volume about him after winter from one of his poems, The Art and Life of Sterling Allen Brown. Sterling Brown, who was born on the campus of Howard University, uh, 1901, who made transition 1989. Sterling Brown, uh, whose father, Sterling N. Brown. Here's something you don't see every day. I pulled it out. I don't think I'm going to take this out because I found this years ago and didn't even know what it was except to know I knew the name. This is Sterling Brown's father who was born into enslavement in Tennessee. I'll come back to Tennessee these days. This is Sterling N. Brown, Sterling Nelson Brown, my own life story. This is Professor Brown. So that looks like that might be public domain. It might be. If it if it isn't, we need to scan it. You probably probably find it. Somebody might find it. Put it in the. Uh, well, definitely hold up the cover again, please. Yeah, yeah. It's called "My Own Life Story." Sterling N. Brown, the father of Sterling Brown, born into enslavement. Sterling Brown was a uh, pastor for many years um, of the Congregational Church in Washington D.C. Debates. Debates involving Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, the American Negro Academy met there. Uh, you know, so Sterling Brown, Sterling N. Brown, very important. Um, he was a professor on the faculty at Howard University for about 40 years. And as people used to say, for most of the life of Howard University, a Sterling Brown was listed on the faculty because his son, Sterling Brown, spent 40 years on the faculty at Howard University, beginning his career at Virginia Union. Shout out to Virginia Union. I know uh, Reverend Wright is here this morning. He always here. So, you know, and when I'm talking about Sterling Brown, I know he, he look, he, he, man, I know he got the stories. Sterling Brown, uh, Sterling Brown's father went to Fisk University. Uh, yes. So if you do the math, you're talking about him at Fisk around the same time that Du Bois is there. 
So Sterling Brown, in fact, knew Du Bois, knew all of them, knew all of these figures. Frederick Douglass uh, was a friend of Sterling N. Brown. His father, he passed in 1895. Sterling, Brown, Sterling A. Brown was born in 1901. Um, when you hear Sterling Brown, you hear the South. But it's a South that is mediated through, like I say, um, his parents who met in, uh, in undergrad, Sterling Brown, Professor Brown, the one I'm, me and Holly and I are talking about today, because Holly Garima and Shrikiana Aina, Shrikiana Garima, who they lived around a corner from Sterling Brown, the Sterling Brown house in Northeast D.C., where he and his wife Daisy, um, who met and married and were married until Daisy made transition about 10 years before Sterling Brown did. Um, Daisy, who was from Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, they met at Virginia Union, I want to say. Yeah, when he was teaching there. Uh, Sterling Brown, who was born I say, on the campus of Howard University, who then went to school in the segregated schools of Washington, D.C., who then went to the great, of course, where else? Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. <laughs> Graduated from there. And uh, we talk about Justin Pearson, who went to Bowdoin. Well, uh, Sterling Brown went to Williams College. Uh, at that time, of course, as we talked about when we talked about the history of Dunbar High School, the valedictorian and salutatorian of Dunbar were guaranteed slots for years at either Williams College or Amherst College. Amherst, of course, is where um, Charles Hamilton Houston went to school. Charlie Drew went to school. It was a book called Black Men of Amherst. I was just reading it the other day. Anyway, it's, it's in the other room. I'm saying all this as a background to this point. When you hear Sterling Brown, you hear the South. You Washington, D.C. is the South for sure. But more importantly, his roots are in the South. But it's also a very cultivated way of speaking because Sterling Brown recognized that the source of Black cultural power, which means ultimately, if we're following Errol Henderson, the source of Black political power, is in the culture. And so Sterling Brown studied poetry. In fact, an excellent, excellent book by Professor Gavin, Joanne Gavin, for many years, um, James Madison University. I want to say she was at William and Mary too. I haven't seen her in a, in a few years. Sterling A. Brown, Building the Black Aesthetic Tradition. It's an excellent book if you get a chance to, to pick this up. She chronicles Sterling Brown's life and work, his literary upbringing, his deep immersion in, uh, in in scholarship, uh, he was taught, for example, at Dunbar High School, um, Jesse Fawcett, that's right, the poet, the writer, friend of W.B. Du Bois, was on the faculty at Dunbar at the time. Angelina Grimke was on the faculty at the time. Um, Haley Douglas, who was the grandson of Frederick Douglas, was on the faculty at the time. First-rate education at Dunbar, as we know. And I'm thinking about it in the context of Justin Pearson because, you know, Justin Pearson clearly got a solid education in Memphis and then went off the boat. Now, Tucker Carlson, an excellent social structure example of, um, what is it? Oh, yeah. Affirmative action, also known as whiteness. On the best day of his long, I hope he lives a thousand years. And on the best day of those thousand years, you will not be able to measure the one thumbnail's inch of filings of any African that went to. Dunbar High School, or really any African living today. But in contrasting that, what you see is that we send our children to get an education to serve the race. Justin Pearson in 2023, Sterling Brown in the 1920s, who said he wanted to follow his father into the teaching profession. His father said, yeah, okay, son, you can do that, but you should probably spend some time somewhere other than Howard. I don't want you to start here, but you can come back here. So he taught at Fisk. Virginia Union, taught at Lincoln, came back to Howard, stayed on that faculty for 40 years. Now, here's where I want to tie this together in terms of the we in these speech acts, because today, as I said it too, because uh, Shriek and Hiley live, or live around the corner from where Sterling Brown's house still is, but of course they passed away years ago, they used to go around there and sit with him. He retired from Howard University in 1969. He was beloved by the students. He was not a black nationalist, but he was rooted in black culture. So Amir Baraka, the couple of years he spent 
as Leroy Jones, of course, out of Newark at Howard, swore by him. He said, the one class I would go to consistently, Sterling Brown class. On the other end of the ideological spectrum, Michael Winston, who wrote an excellent tribute in the April 1989 issue of New Directions, Howard University, there's Sterling Brown again, the famous picture to him. Again, Sterling Brown was a master teacher. Brown's students, uh, Olive Taylor, we talked about Olive Taylor, right? But previous generations, I mean, he, and I, I we should do, a, you should know, Prof on Sterling Brown. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna do that. His birthday is May the 1st. So I'll come back to Sterling Brown. I don't wanna evoke him today for a, uh, for a long time. I mean, he, along with Ralph Bunch and others, Doxy Wilkerson and them, worked on the American Dilemma Project. He was the director of Negro content for the WPA, the Writers Project, that came out of uh, the Roosevelt era, and you, he, he, his battles are chron real chronicle, trying to get black content that wasn't caricatures and things like that. But the reason I'm bringing him up is because Sterling Brown, who was born into what would be considered a very elite Negro family in Washington D.C., was contemptuous of pretension, was often accused of being a little too rough. Why? Because you would find him in Nashville when they were on faculty at Fisk. You would find him in the barbershops and the juke joints. You would find him bringing, when he was at Virginia Union, the cats who would sing the blues and all that to his class. You play this right here. We're going to have a conversation. When he was at Howard University, he'd be in Cook Hall, which is still there. Uh, Cook Hall in the lounge with his blues records, with Barack and him sitting around going through his encyclopedic history of Black culture in the United States and beyond. It was Sterling Brown who, among others, argued, in fact, um, uh, let me see. I thought I had a copy because I started pulling my Sterling Brown stuff for this afternoon. Oh, yeah. This is a nice, this is a reprint edition of the Negro Poetry and Drama and the Negro in American Fiction. Sterling Brown, in many ways, said, if you want to represent us, you've got to sit in and with us. And there's no way you can pigeonhole us into one way of speaking, one way of being, one way of doing. However, there is a we deep into in our culture, and you're not gonna find it in them Negroes who's trying to front for you. Just is deeply insecure. So, so in many ways, Sterling Brown found himself at odds with the black bourgeoisie. And he found himself grounded in Africana, what we would call Africana ways of knowing, our governance formations. He was absolutely a keen listener for Africana cultural meaning making, our speech, our idioms, the way we move through the world. And then in terms of movement and memory, he was absolutely deliberately committed to trying to create a genealogy. Not a genealogy that will be separate from American genealogy social structure genealogy in the U.S. context, global genealogy. No, but that would be very clear that there are distinct African ways. He would not call it African. In fact, he, he would like Ray Floating. I'm going to say Negro. He like Negro. So this isn't even ideological. You understand what I'm saying? In fact, one of the great anthologies of our time, still not duplicated in terms of its moment because you can't really duplicate things that happen in certain moments in time and space. You should just need to continue and do your own. Um, He convened a triumvirate, one of his former students, Ulysses Lee, who was by then at Lincoln University, his colleague, ultimately at Howard, Arthur P. Davis, who was then at Virginia Union University, and he, and in 1941, they did this book. This is called The Negro Caravan, Brown, Davis, and Lee. Be careful here, because these is kind of hard. I hope they bring, I'm sure the, the American Negro is probably going to bring this back into print and find some good white press. But maybe we can get a copyright right and do it with a black. <laughs> the Negro Caravan, writing by American Negroes, selected and edited by Brown, Davis, and Lee. This is the 41 edition, one of them. And it's 1,000, including index, it's 1,082 pages. And it is a collection of short stories, novels, excerpts from novels, poetry. He was very heavily influenced by Paul Dunbar, but he said Dunbar, who has the brilliance and range to communicate black life, still has two, he says it's authentic, but there's a caricature dimension of it and white folks like it. And that's one of the reasons they kind of promote him. He died so young, Dunbar did. And we've talked in passing about Dunbar. But the, the poet with which Brown is most closely associated generally when you pair them is Langston Hughes. 
Langston Hughes, who worked, who wrote about the working class people, his simple stories, just be simple. When you hear Sterling Brown's poems like Old Limb or the Slim poems, which kind of gesture toward one of them brothers he used to bring to Virginia and play the guitar in the classroom and, and the black bourgeois is like, what is this Negro doing? He said, man, this, this is where my students come from. We're going to have this conversation about us. He's got one slim in hell. Where he does it, so you got the poetry in here, you've got um folk literature, so to speak. There's everybody in here, really. Drama, speeches, pamphlets, and letters, biography, essays, historical essays, social essays, cultural essays, personal essays. He and Elaine Locke working out theories of culture, sometimes at odds, sometimes in agreement. Let me put this over here somewhere where it won't get damaged. Anyway, Brown is saying. We have to look, this is where I want to tie this again, Justin Pearson. He says, you know, if Sterling Brown were physically here today, I can hear him listening to a Justin Pearson and saying, don't judge him, but listen to him. Don't condemn him, but critique him. Sterling Brown might say, that is the cadence and speech of the of our people. That is one of the one of the forms of cadence and speech. But in this moment of social address, we must also pay attention to whether or not, like Dunbar, this might be a moment when we want to overburden that moment that we hear this young brother Pearson. Because one, we understand that what we would call the social structure wants to elevate and curate him as representative of all of us. And Brown would say, don't do that. We're very complex, but we know that that's what you do, which means number two, we have a responsibility. And this is where it gets very difficult in the governance formation as we think about this African states framework. We have a responsibility to be as honest as we can with each other without, which is why the conversation we had earlier, Prof, about how you balance that in a space where we know y'all got a different agenda. We got to be as honest as we can without becoming pawns in the larger game of Black oppression. That is a difficult thing. And Brown spends his life grappling with that. He arguing with Gunnar Murdahl saying, no, you got to get this cultural representation right. He's arguing with the people in the Works Progress Administration when he put they put him over the, the writing part of these state guides where he's saying, y'all going to put that in this about the Negro in Mississippi? Oh, you went to Georgia and said you ain't see no Negro? What the hell? He's editing everything, battling with you because I have to be able to communicate this. This is at the same time that he's writing and publishing his own poetry, that he's teaching generations of students, becomes this beloved heroic figure. And so I'll end with this for today. The question of, because we entered today with the speech act of Justin Pearson and what black speech acts are used for and used against when it comes to black people not only in this country, but in the, around the world. And so when we think about ourselves in a contemporary moment, when we think about ourselves in a moment where we are more publicly diverse in terms of our blackness in the world than at any time in modern history, we have to ask ourselves, what are the choices that we make in, as we construct this we? And what are the choices that a social structure makes that absolutely does not mean the vast majority of us will? All over the papers today, whether it be uh, the International Money Fund demanding that these African countries restructure their debt. And now, you know, are we going back to the 80s and 90s where y'all put this austerity measures on them in the world today? That all that's that's going on. The massive African people, Ghana, for example, owe so much money that they're saying they may have to choose between health care and education programs and debt service. Meanwhile, China's like, maybe we'll forget a debt, maybe we won't. The IMF is like, if we're gonna get y'all any more debt forgiveness, we need to see these changes. And meanwhile, people say, I need an education. Okay, while all that is going on. They're curating, I was looking at the, today's uh, Financial Times, let me see if I can find it right, in the magazine, this is the magazine part, where they tell you all the billionaire stuff you want to buy, right? They got this whole thing on these black artists they loving so much, the Africa Connection. This is a young Nigerian sister who is doing uh, stuff around furniture. Here's a, he, here's a sister right here who was born in Germany. She's based in London, but her people are from Nigeria, around Kano. So, uh, Eve Sonake. 
uh, Peter Mabeo. He's doing stuff around furniture. Now, all this is high-end luxury stuff. At the same time, the place they're from, the, the mass people are suffering. So you can enjoy blackness without alleviating the struggle of African people. As the brother, Ghanaian brothers, I was talking to them earlier this week. We were having a conversation with some cats, man. And his brother was like, you know, it's funny. It ain't funny, really. He said, the people who took the plants and made paper money out of them have all this stuff. And then here we are, he's Ghanaian. He said, we walk it on top of the gold that backs all that stuff, the most precious metals, and we don't have anything. And he said, oh yeah, and the plants they made the paper out of, the trees and stuff, that's ours too. <laughs> so how in the hell we end up with nothing? <laughs> so, the, but the minute you try to withdraw from that system, this is when that system says, oh, we got to come for you. And if we got to give a few artists some stuff because we like having some African flavored things in our house, that's fine. But the masses of y'all owe us $150 billion, damn it. And you ain't going to actually $800 billion in the case of some of the external funding, uh, about $200 million billion of it to the West. Um, so, yeah, y'all not going to, mm -mm, y'all going to suffer. See, these two things can happen at the same time. So Justin Pearson and Justin Jones in the Tennessee legislature giving powerful speeches, being representative, and now in the public eye in a way that they were not two weeks ago, now are under the crushing burden of answering what comes next. Because if it's just going to be speeches, it becomes a proxy fight. And then we, well, for that matter, I might as well play a video game. But you can't get any policy done. Can you get any policy done? It's going to be more than just speeches on the floor of the legislature. You can't get any legislation passed. Although that was when Justin Jones was uh, coming back at Rogan because they just introduced and in trying to pass House Bill in Tennessee 1376. That's their version called the Higher Education Freedom of Expression Act. That's their version of the anti-CRT bill in Tennessee. That's when they got he, he got into the beef with him. Uh, the other day, but our those two things can exist at the same time. The black elite gonna be fine, so to speak. But it's the masses of our people, the, the larger formations of the people, the people who are doing the suffering that we, if we're serious about group advancement, are gonna have to really immerse and ground in. This is who Sterling Brown was studying and being with. This is who Errol Henderson is saying came out as black power formations trying to create these independent institutions that ultimately go under in part because of external repression. Not that we didn't have our own internal problems. And here we are in 2023 where you can have black people who a social structure were curated as black for its interests that don't represent black interests like Tim Scott, maybe an example of that, oh, launching his campaign for president at Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter, South Carolina walking under an American flag and I'm looking at him and I'm saying to myself, suppressing the urge to connect him to a very specific uh, cartoon character from Bill Cosby and the Cosby Kids and I will refrain from doing that this morning but while watching him uh, talk about, uh, about his uh, 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 career and upbringing I pulled from the shelf another moment at Fort Sumter Another uh, moment at, at, at Fort Sumter that took place in 1863. And we're going to conclude with this. There's a couple of things that happened this week I wanted to mention. And that, of course, was, let me see if I got the date right. Y'all better stop playing. You better stop playing with me. It couldn't be. Well, I'll be damned. This is from Larry Crow. I know Larry and all the BC in here. Life and Public Services of Martin Robeson Delaney. You know, we did Delaney, right? Watch this, y'all. The eventful 14th of April. He didn't stop playing. Which was so eagerly awaited came and the and the earliest beams of the morning found the city of the sea alive with preparations for the brilliant scene at Sumter, unconscious of its fearful tragic close at Washington. Remember, this is the first place, this is where the Civil War launched and they took that American flag down and then they had the, the Confederates had it. Now, uh, Tim Scott walking under the, uh, the, uh, the American flag, talking about how, you know, this represents the best of a fool. Do you know when that flag was put back? Now, that's your flag. You won't find me wearing it. But when you know when that flag went back up, this is what Martin Delaney talking about. Major Delaney. Highest black commissioned officer, also Major Augusta, who worked at Freeman's Hospital, was a surgeon. Major Martin Delaney 
sails to Fort Sumter for the raising of the American flag after they took it back for the Confederates. That's how that flag got up on their pole. Tim, mission accomplished, Scott. Major Delaney embarked to witness the ceremony on the historical steamer planter with its gallant commander, Robert Small whose deeds will live in song and story, whose unparalleled feat and heroic courage in the harbor of Charleston under the bristling guns of rebel batteries, bearing comparison with the proudest record of our war, will remain commemorative of Negro strategy and valor, except in the mind of Tim Scott. See the scene, y'all. Fort Sumter, beginning of the Civil War. The Union Army has taken it back. South Carolina majority black. Delaney sailing on the boat Robert Smalls and his people took from the Confederates, the planter. He the captain of the planter. Now, sailing to the island in 1863. Oh, the war is not over. Years to go. But they took South Carolina back. Come on, Tim. Do you remember? Do you remember? You clearly don't remember. And guess who else was on the boat? Oh, you're not going to believe it. He says, watch this. On the quarter deck of the steamer, the major remained an interested witness. Beside him, beside Martin Delaney, stood one whose father, believing and loving the doctrine that all men were born free and equal and within sight of the emblem of freedom as it floated from the battlements of Sumter, to my flag, dared to aim a blow by which to free his race, betrayed before his plans were mature. The scaffold gave to Denmark Vesey and his 22 slave hero compatriots in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822, the like answer which Charleston, Charlestown, Virginia gave John Brown in 1859. Picture that, Martin Delaney sailing to Fort Sumter on the ship captained by Robert Small standing next to the son of Denmark Vesey. Tim Scott, you bring shame to your ancestors. But guess what? We're here. And we know you don't represent nobody. We know you auditioned for vice president, you and Nikki Haley and every damn body else because the hillbilly who are going to elect Donald Trump if he got to be under the jail. <laughs> so you go ahead and skin, uh, skin, uh, skin and grin. So as we kind of conclude on representation, you can have black representatives that don't represent us. Our work is to reconstruct, to energize, to extend, to connect with institutional formations that are black and connected to non-Black formations, which are deeper down in that class structure. So that when you see a representative of us, they are truly representing us, not just themselves and what of their individual interests are. This is, for example, today's uh, New York Times because it is Jackie Robinson Day, isn't it? Uh, so I think it's Jackie Robinson Day today, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody in Major League Baseball wears number 42 today, I think. Wow. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. You know, and, and of course, if y'all want to know, we've done extensive work on Jack Roosevelt Robinson. So we're not going to do that right now. But I thought I would mention in today's New York Times this beautiful argue, uh, article on one of the many Jackie Robinson scholars. Shout out to the wow. century plus old now, Rachel Robinson, the Jackie Robinson Foundation, which is 50 years old today, which is a scholarship program providing an average of $32,000 over four years to 242 students consistently. I've had a number of Robinson scholars. If you're a Robinson scholar now in Nubia, or if you're watching this later on YouTube, drop it, please, in the comments, because there are a lot of Robinson scholars who have graduated. Here's a very prominent one right now. Yes, Lauren Underwood was a Jackie Robinson scholar. You understand? Wow. It's a beautiful thing, Professor Hunter. Isn't it? I mean, wow. Jackie Robinson said, a life is unimportant except the effect it has on other lives. When Robinson died far too young in his early 50s of that diabetes, because as his wife as would say sometimes, because he carried the whole race on his back. She said, no, we will continue this work. So Rachel Robinson has been the face and the animating force, Sharon Robinson and their daughter, so many others, the Robinsons, David Robinson, oh, and beyond that, the whole Jackie Robinson Foundation has been, in fact, let me just uh, shout her out here very quickly. Um, Della Britton, the president and chief executive of the foundation, shout out to Della Britton as well. For low these 50 years, all these college graduates, I, it makes me smile every time I'm in class and it's usually around now 
The students will say that the car, I'm not going to be here next week. Why? Well, I'm a Jackie Robinson. I say no more. I know y'all got to go because every year the Robinson scholars have to come to New York for the meeting because they got to report out. They got to do public service. They got to talk about it. It ain't just scholarship money. It ain't just individual Negroes. Oh, I'm going to achieve. <laughs> no. You got a mission. As the old folks used to say, a charge to keep, I have. A God to glorify. <laughs> so anyway, so this is what it means to be a representative. Clarence Thomas, are you a representative? No, you're a wholly owned subsidiary of billionaires and you're in trouble now. You look scared now. Why? Because it's coming out how much they own you. You don't represent us, sir. Even though you said for years when you sat on the bench that you didn't talk because uh, I'm from Georgia and uh, I, I, I speak a, 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 a variation of Gullah. It's a language called Gullah. And uh, I just, you know, didn't want, to, I grew up uh, being made ashamed. That's a lie. Ain't nobody in the United States more proud of the way they talk than them Gullah Geechee Negroes. So if you're going to sit up here, that's because you didn't spent your life trying to run from them. You're not our representative. We talking about Black Speech Acts today, Professor Hunter. <laughs> Clarence Thomas has the tongue of Africa in his mouth, even as it is trained by Holy Cross and Yale to speak with a certain clarity. And when he has said that I like with my wife to camp in uh, Walmart parking lots because I come from common stock. Now we know why you a lie, because you don't represent us. And uh -huh. Sterling Brown would clown the hell out of you <laughs> if he was around. He said, "Cause Sterling Brown said, I know that Negro. That's the Negro who sound like us, but act like them. He's not a representative." So a couple other things, and I'll leave the rest of this for. Next week, I, may, I I took note of the fact that I guess Jay Z trying to build a casino in Manhattan. Oh man, Broadway people mad as hell. Um, and Montana banned TikTok as if TikTok could be banned by a state. These hillbillies then lost their damn mind. But I I I want to um I, I want to end with this. How should I how, how should I put this? Yes, tomorrow. Actually, today. So if you're in the DMV and you want to go down, if you're not coming by to see uh, Holly and them screen after winter, after winter is the documentary. The only documentary in existence with Sterling Brown talking about his life in a, in, in a visual form as these two filmmakers, Shriek and Holly Garima, went over to his house, talking to him on the porch and said, can we bring a camera by here and made a whole documentary called After Winter. You can't see it anywhere. Holly and them not giving it up for, you know, for for to be, you know, moved other places. Maybe we can get them to do a screening over here in Nubia, though, Prof. I may be able to talk him into we see see if he's in the mood one day, if they're in the mood one day. But we're going to do a talk back. They'll probably live stream the talk back. My homie from Memphis, my 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 young girl, Michaela uh, Skurlock, who is from Memphis, Howard University graduate. Um, also, I was asking her about Justin Pearson. And I said, you know, just he said, yeah, you know, I know them. OK, OK. See, that's how you know people. You don't know people by asking MSNBC and CNN. You know people who, by asking they people who they are. So I asked the Memphian about another Memphian. But at any rate, they're probably going to live stream after we show the, the, the documentary, after they show the documentary, he and I are going to talk about it and with the community too. So you might want to go to Sankova's website and you can see that. But also this today in the District of Columbia is the annual Compensated Emancipation Day Parade and concert free concert downtown dc pennsylvania avenue the headliner is from our generation prop that would be none other than the god mc himself rakim um, ah! i'm like come on man i want to go see rakim but hey i love sterling brown sterling brown will be all uh, like an intellectual godson a uh, grandson of sterling brown because sterling brown's thing is black speech is not all the same so when you hear the best of hip-hop sterling brown would say yeah yeah, this is what it looks like. Wait, did it come from the people? Yeah. Did somebody else shape it? Nah. Then listen to it. Don't be mad. Listen to it. Now, once you listen to it, you have an obligation to critique it, to analyze it, 
You okay? I don't like that. I like that. Okay, all right. Well, then let's have that governor come. Then here come the other people. Well, I think it's very interesting because I mean, in some ways, Kendrick Lamar is like a a, a black Shakespeare. Okay, you sir, you should go over there because we're not interested in anything you have to say right now. If we want to come over and talk to you, we will. And in fact, since we didn't send for you, <laughs> don't come over here. And if you tiptoe around the ear hustle. You make sure it's ear hustling. You don't have an opinion right now because even with the best intent, you're going to interrupt something and then three of these Negroes over here having this debate going to take your side and the next thing you know, there is no we. And meanwhile, your thing is still going and we over here arguing with each other. Mm -mm. So with all due respect, and we mean this very sincerely, with all due respect, which is a very important phrase if you stop to think about it, pause. Anyway, Compensated Emancipation Act Notes today here. This is a very interesting little book called Abraham Lincoln and the End of Slavery in the District of Columbia. It was actually produced by the um, the Capitol Hill branch of the D.C. Public Library. So I don't know if y'all can get your hands on it, um, but, you know, I don't mind scanning it. I mean, I think they wanted it to be distributed. This is a book that collects a lot of the documents around the time. This is what happened in the District of Columbia, for those of you who didn't know. In, um, in 1862, let me do April 1862, April the 16th to be exact, which is why it's celebrated on the Saturday before in terms of parade, but it is a holiday here and has been a holiday in the District of Columbia since it was declared a holiday in 2005 by the mayor of the District of Columbia at the time. In 1862, the Africans of the District of Columbia were freed by the federal government, Congress and the uh, President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. It's the only Africans he freed. This is where we're going to end. <laughs> Let me see, can I find it? So y'all, because some people may not know about this, and even though we talk about it every year, we should do it one more time. Here it is right here, page 69. Let me go to it very quickly. Here we are. Here's the act. These Negroes, they gave, I think, just under $2 million to free the almost 3,000 Africans of the District of Columbia, and they paid up to $300 apiece to the Europeans who had them enslaved. Imagine that. Then they set aside money, and they told every Black person who had been enslaved in D.C., hey, come here, what? Listen, we got a proposition for you. What? Here's the proposition. You can stay here, walk around, do whatever you want to do within limits. Or we'll give you some money to leave. Go where? Lincoln is like, Haiti, Nicaragua, leave the country. Compensated man. Now I'm going to end with this. Here it is. This was the addendum to that. This never got passed. March 14, 1862, letter to J.A. McDougal, Executive Mansion, Washington. That will be known as the White House. This is from Abe Lincoln. My dear sir, as to the expensiveness of the plans of gradual emancipation with compensation proposed in the late message, please allow me one or two brief suggestions. Less than one half of one day's cost of the war would pay for all the slaves in Delaware at $400 per head. Thus, all the slaves in Delaware, by the census of 1860, or 1,798 at $400 apiece, cost of the slaves $719,200, one day's cost of the war, $2 million. Again, what is he proposing, y'all? Let me keep going. Again, less than 87 days cost of this war would at the same price pay for all in Delaware, Maryland, District of Columbia, Kentucky, and Missouri. Thus, the slaves in Delaware, Maryland, District of Columbia, Kentucky, and Missouri, 432,622 enslaved people at $400 apiece would cost $173,048,800. 87 days cost of the war is $174 million. Abraham Lincoln says, do you doubt that taking the initiatory steps on the part of those states and this district would shorten the war more than 87 days and thus be actual saving of expenses? Then he says, a word as to the time and manner of incurring the expense. Suppose, for instance, 
a state devises and adopts a system by which the institution absolutely ceases therein by a named day, say January 1st, 1882. What did I just say? He wrote this in 1862. He says, let's say slavery, the states where they got people enslaved says, we'll give up slavery. 1862? No, 1882. Let's say January 1882. Then let the sum to be paid by such a state, by the United States, be ascertained by taking from the census of 1860 the number of slaves within the state and multiplying that number by 400. The United States to pay such sums to the state in 20 equal annual installments and 6% bonds of the United States in sum thus given as to time and manner, I think would not be half as onerous as one as would be an equal sum raised now for the indefinite prosecution of the war. But of this you can judge as well as I. I enclose a census table for your convenience. Yours very truly, Abraham Lincoln. What is he proposing, y'all? Y'all friend. <laughs> the one Mary Anderson stood on the steps of the statue and sang on Easter Sunday and the Negroes weep to this day without knowing no history. What is he proposing? He's saying, look, first of all, I ain't freeing no N-words in any state that's still in the Union. Delaware, Maryland. And if we free them, Let's pay the white boys that got them enslaved. It would be less than a half day's cost of the war for Delaware and for all the states where I didn't free. Abraham Lincoln ain't free nobody. The only Africans he signed a document that freed anybody was in D.C. and he paid the white boys and he proposed doing it, not only for the border states, but this is where the roots of the Emancipation Proclamation he did sign come from because the Emancipation says, if by January 1863, you are not back in the Union, the people who were enslaved in your state are free. Now he got to enforce that with a gun, which means Robert Smalls and them boys, Martin Delaney, any Freddie Douglas' son's got to go down there and stick that damn piece of paper on the end of a bayonet and make it stand up. He freed no one to evoke my man, Lerone Bennett. He was forced into glory, but this is what he proposed. And if anybody tried to tell you different, tell them to run back this video. I just read it word for word. He said, we'll go to them states and say, if y'all will stop fighting us, we'll pay you for every man, woman, and child you got enslaved. We'll spread out over 20 years. Back it by bonds of the United States, maybe by January 1st, 1882, they'll be free and you'll be rich. That's your friend. Hmm. I would say that Emancipation Day is today. Of course, Congress didn't act on it. They did the Emancipation Proclamation. Black folk to the tune of 189,000 Africans formally, meaning all men, 10,000 in the Navy, and women like Araminta, the great Harriet Ross, married named Tubman, Harriet Ross Tubman, Minty as she called herself, leading and directing troops in battle, freed ourselves. Y'all let that man rest wherever they got him buried, Springfield, Illinois, whatever. Y'all better stop. <laughs> anyway, enjoy the concert. Y'all see Rakim, tell me how it was. <laughs> yes. Well, here he is. Yeah, yeah we're, we're gonna... Uh listen to the voice of sterling brown to end i just wanted to first of all thank you um this is who uh um i think some of this conversation is going to stay in nubia because it was very intimate and personal um oh, oh okay some of it will um but i also someone in the chat wanted to break down your 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 orisha shirt um, oh i know you Obama, it. and i know yamaya uh, and I know Allegwa. Okay, can you break that down for the okay. uninformed? Oh, Ogun, Chango, Chango. Some of some of the spellings are going to be in Spanish. Okay. So let's start with Obatala. That's God. That's the the Obatala, uh, yeah, the, the kind of broad Obatala. concept. Because there's no, you know, it's only one God. These are just just conversations on the the kind of manifestations of God. The the the, the people in Kemet would call them the Netchers, right? So about that, Yemila, we know, right? Like Yemaya right. and, and, and Oshun, which you see the C spelling there is probably for the Spanish speaking community, maybe even Portuguese, the Latin based languages. So if you're in Cuba, Puerto Rico, if you're doing uh, Santeria or Macumba or in um, in Brazil, Caromble, you know, setting them tell you. Then Yemaya is out of the water. Yeah. Alegua is the the what I know from IT. Alegua is like the Vodun. They, they they call him the you know the, vo the voodoo god or whatever the yes. underworld. Papa Legba, he's at Papa the Legba. That's okay. right. In fact, this is the one who we would say when we talked about remember Prof. We talked about Bugs Bunny. Yes, Bugs Bunny. 
Okay. And, you know, Allegra is the one where he gonna make you choose. You can't stay at the crossroad with him. The trickster. He irritate you, the trickster. No question. He go, he, and so, yes, yes. And, and of course, Ashun. Ogun, well, Oshun, of course, is with Yemaya. These are the two sisters. Women, right. Yeah, women, and of course, who are at the center of it because the, the, they control the water, the rivers, the lakes, you know, the ocean. Meaning, you know, that's what our bodies are made of. I mean, come on, people talk about, hey, man, I ain't mad at the Christians and the Muslims and the Jews, but let's be clear, Africans knew who God was. <laughs> you know, anyway. So, and of course, let me see, Ogun, right? You know, I, I used to tell students all the time, whether it be Ramses the second or Fifty Cent, the whole notion of that that fire, that iron, the one that will put them hands on you, Ogun. <laughs> this Ogun is the blade of the Haitian Revolution. In other words, let's get this cut. This we're gonna get free. This is anytime we get ready to get somebody when Karen Hunter busts up in there and say boom boom, that's the Ogun spirit. <laughs> you know what I'm the warrior spirit. Uh Orula is one way of saying Orumala. So the whole question of intellectual work dividing, my man uh Baba Seku in, in Philly, we used to compare uh he would compare Orumala to um Jehudi, or in fact, Jehudi, who um today's New York Times has an obituary uh for the great Kamal Braithwaite. This is the uh, special edition of Aperture Magazine. Please hold that book up because that is beautiful. Oh, yeah, that's his wife on the cover. Okay. No question. Black is beautiful. It's a special issue of this. He just made transition. In uh, fact, his obituary, I'll show it to y'all in, let me see, about maybe 10 seconds. I'll just show it to you because uh, I knew his brother um, better than him. And that, of course, was the great Alambe Brath. Sons of the Caribbean, their parents migrated. There is uh, Kamal Braithwaite, the photographer who made Black beautiful, so to speak. Dies there he is with his camera. Very important. He made transition on the first of this month, first of April. They founded something called the African Jazz Art Societies and Studios. I'm mentioning it because it's so funny how the ancestors work. Because there's a photograph in here, if I can find it quickly, because they used to have, in fact, here they all are, lobbying them. That's the association there. This whole thing is just, these are Africans in New York. So those of you who know Older Twinji Village, you know, uh, let me see. <laughs> Look, here go these Negroes at the beach. <laughs> Doing their thing. So, you know, uh, let me see if I can find this. Oh, yeah. Those of you coming to America, remember the, the Black pageant, Miss Black uh, Queens pageant or whatever? They used to have Miss Natural Standard of Beauty pageant in Harlem. This is the Standard of Beauty pageant <laughs> in Harlem. In other words... Wow. You know, even when you watch it coming to America, there's a movement in memory to it. If I could find this quickly, though, because I wanted to. Sh oh, here we go. Uh, actually, this isn't it, but I want to show this picture anyway. Here's the young boy looking at the James Brown poster. <laughs> James Brown was a fear on the 930 show. He photographed everybody. He went to Zaire and photographed uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the Ali. Here we go. Here is the couple power couple. Abby Lincoln and Max Roach, Amanita Mosica and Max Roach. Here she is kissing. Uh, it's titled an Ibis, but that is Jehudi. Jehudi, the scholar, the intellect, the writer, the person who inscribes a Yoruba gloss on that might be Orula. But you know, and of course, Shango. Shango is another war spirit, spirit, thunder, the, the brother who, you know, forget Thor. Is Chango, and of course, the relationship between Chango and um, Oshun. Think of Jay Z and Beyonce. In this sense, there is a, a, in the Odu Ifa. There's a story where, of course, Chango is sleeping with all the women. He, you know, he would have been the one that freak Nick or whatever. All the women want Chango. All the women want Chango, but Chango wants Oshun. So Oshun finally relents, and after she finishes making love with him, she drowns him. And then brings him back. Let me show you what this is about. So if you want to stay, <laughs> why they spend so much time in Cuba? I don't know what I don't know. No, and we'll never know the conversations Jay Z and Beyonce have. But just know that Oshun, that's that's the yellow. That's where my girl uh, Shanice Thompson, my former student, got her PhD. She wrote a dissertation called "Lemonade and Other Yellow Things." She uh -huh. traced Oshun through lemonade. <laughs> so you know when you see Beyonce, a lot of that stuff's very intentional. Y'all pay attention. Right. Anyway, I'm saying that sounds more like Will and Jada, but I digress. Will and Jada too. Well, actually, that's who, of course, if you listen to Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, that's who Harold Melvin is begging for eight minutes on "I Miss You." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, and this is we're in the entertainment. Um, the prayers for for full recovery. Jamie Foxx apparently had a stroke. Um, oh, 
And so that's what it uh, was. Yeah. Or, or yeah, what what ends up being a stroke, I guess, a bl- blood clot or a burst blood clot. Um, so we, is we there word is there word? Yeah, how is he? No, I mean, it's you know, his his daughter put out the statement a couple of days ago, uh, and there's been a flood of you know, of course, uh, well wishes and prayers, you know. But we are, we're in community with with us, and life is precious and fragile, and which is why. The, the time we spend with one another, the time we spend in critique of one another right. uh, shouldn't uh, over, you know, overshadow the fact that we're in community and our responsibility is to uplift um, first, first. Forever. So, Forever. So that. You know, even if we jokingly want to talk about, you know, the different art that's out there and why we don't like it, ultimately life should su- supersede all of that. So no question. No question. Uh, no question. And we send all the best energies. And yes, finally, um, everyone that's in Nubia, uh, you can go to the bookshelf of narrative. Uh, just ask Ahmad, and he'll do that at some point. Drop the um, Sterling in oh, uh, good. Brown book, my my own life story. Nice. So that, that'll be uh, on our bookshelf, and um, trying to get as many books in there as possible. So that's the relationship between narrative and Nubia. Narrative is the repository. Uh, you only get to Nubia through narrative. So you already have a narrative subscription. Just go in the bookshelf and see all of the books that are, are there. Rodney, um, framings of, of my brother's framings. What is it? Framings? Yeah, the groundings. With our groundings with my yeah. brother. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we have, you know, a lot of um, <laughs> books that are, are there that yes. uh, Dr. Carr has talked about. So, you know, spend some time with that. Be safe in them streets, Dr. Be safe. Carr. Boy, I'm good. Yes, uh, and and uh, the Tennessee folk, um, it, the reckoning is coming. That that guy, last name Sexton. Yeah, uh, lot of stuff coming out about him. Whether his residency is, you know, valid. Oh, you, you know, already know. Yeah, the same man that uh, refused to unseat an actual child predator. Come on now. To throw out three people battling for the life of children and he might have a mistress. So they're trolling the hell out of him right now. Yeah, we're seeing some, some nasty potential stuff on so but we say less. Like you say, what is what's done in the dark comes to light. Always, always. Love you. Let's <laughs> Love let's, you. Uh, let's finish uh with sitting with this ancestor and thank you for sending me this uh because I never heard his voice before. So yeah. He did, he did an album with the Langston Hughes too, but this is his most famous album, Smith Sportways. Slim right. and Hill. <laughs>